Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Last time I talked about my entire story as an attractions cast member in Tomorrowland as well as some of my crazy guest interactions while working at Star Tours. If you're interested in watching those, go ahead and check out that uh, car that probably popped up to see a playlist of all the other videos. These are now available in podcast form so you can listen to them on YouTube music as well or you just listen to it in the background while you're doing something on your desktop. I don't care what you do man. Anyway, this video will be covering the guest interactions I had while working at my hiring attraction of Disneyland's Autopia. For those unaware, I learned Autopia when I hired into the company back in May of 2019 and worked it off and on until my eventual departure in December of 2023. Now, this video will be ranging from those time periods, so some stories are pre-pandemic while others, if not most, are post-pandemic, to give you a general idea. If it is crucial to the story, I will mention when it took place, but just know most of these crazy stories you're going to see are from the post-pandemic side. I was also at my other two attractions, so this video is not going to be in chronological order. This video will be sectioned off into chapters, and timestamps should be available on the video itself or in the description. I do apologize audio only listeners, but uh, I'll say the chapter out when I'm uh, on a new chapter. Another thing to keep in mind is that this video and this series are meant for listening, so while the thumbnail might have been um, clickbaity, just know it's mainly just narration over some somewhat related b-roll footage. I also highly recommend having a basic knowledge of the surface level operations of the attraction, and I do have a mini-series that covers all three of my attractions. Again, a card should have popped up or something. Anyway, without further ado, I present to you my guest interaction stories from Autopia. And don't worry, you won't see my face again until the end of the video. Greeter and Lightning Lane Just like the last video, I'll be starting off with some of my stories at the Greeter position and the Fast Pass and Lightning Lane positions. Keep in mind, when I hired in and learned this attraction, we did not have Fast Pass yet, as it was literally added a month before the park shut down for the pandemic and was eventually brought back as the uh, terrible lightning lane that makes everybody, you know, have a big man-baby fit when it doesn't go their way. I'll get to that in a bit though. If you are unaware, Autopia has two height requirements. One just to ride the attraction and the other to drive alone. Autopia is an attraction that is powered by the guests, so they have complete control over driving their own vehicle. It's part of the reason why, you know, there's a second height requirement, because that's the bare minimum to reach the pedal. Anyway, the greeter position would have to scan for these requirements, and we would get a ton of pushback because, oh, well, they could sit in my lap, or the famous, oh, it's okay, I'll just hold them, when it comes to their kids under 32 inches. This is a common occurrence at any attraction with the height requirement, and I can promise you it's not just the attractions I know. But I have some stories at the greeter position. This first one comes from a lady who was trying to get her baby on the ride, and I told her that babies can't come on. She attempted to get past me two more times by sneaking in with the crowds of people, and I called her out every time. Believe it or not, she came back for a fourth time, but the baby was no longer with her. Or that's what she wanted me to believe. I saw her next to the nearby gift shop shoving her baby into a backpack so she can go on the ride. It's just like, are you serious lady? Not only is that dangerous for your child, but I saw you do it. You know, it's not like she went around the corner out of sight when I couldn't see her do it, but she was like literally like 10 feet away from me. And also on top of that, I don't think backpacks cry like a baby. I then told her to take her kid out and leave our entrance because it was getting ridiculous. She ended up cussing me out like I was the bad guy and left in a huff. Like, even if she did get past me, they double check before boarding, or at least they're supposed to, but that's a different can of worms for a different video. Another fun time is when our attraction is closed and you're stuck at this position with an angry crowd of people. I didn't really cover this in my tours video because I didn't really have any people try to act like a moron and when it came to the attraction being closed. Well, our attraction was closed for one day for a broken axle, and I was at Greeter when this happened. So I closed the chain to obviously not let more people in, and then this one guy came up after our attraction was starting to clear out and said he had to get in because this was his last ride of the day. I told him I apologized, but we we're closed, and he told me that I didn't understand. He was wanting to go on this before he left. Mind you, this is like around 11 o'clock in the morning, so I'm sort of surprised that he was 
leaving this early, but I don't question people and their value of a ticket. Anyway, he was getting frustrated because not all our attracts were closed yet, but I told him we are escorting guests off the attraction itself and can't have people driving around when others are walking on the tracks themselves. He then screamed in my face that he couldn't get on the baby car ride and ran toward the railroad station. I thought, huh, that's the end of that. Well, to the surprise of no one, that was not the end of that, as the guy ran down to the railroad station and ended up hopping the fence where, you know, cast members can go through. He then ran onto the track and hopped into a car. What this bozo didn't realize is that we shut off all our cars when we do a full attraction evacuation, and they weren't going to go anywhere unless we turned them back on, or he was smart enough to turn the cars back on himself, which he probably wasn't. He ended up hopping into three different cars before one of my coworkers told him to leave. He was then escorted out by one of my other coworkers that wasn't in a safety position. It's like, bro, we told you we were closed, but screaming in my face and running onto the attraction was just the easier option, I guess. If he would have waited just like 30 minutes, we would have most likely been opened again. I didn't see the guy for the rest of the day, but I do hope he left the park after that because he was acting like a buffoon. Let's hop on over to the Fast Pass and Lightning Lane position. Pre-pandemic, it was called Fast Pass, and unfortunately, we didn't really have the line for it, nor did we have the scanners like other attractions do. We just used our little rinky-dinky phones to scan people in, which 90% of the time would be dead from not being charged correctly. This led to a headache of problems, and on top of that, we scan people in our actual line and not in the front of the attractions, like, you know, others do. I'm sort of explaining this because when we did finally get scanners for the brand new and totally not terrible Lightning Lane Edition, they sort of just slapped it into our line, and it's not terrible, but, you know, it's not the best. The guest issues would arise when people don't know how the system works, and that's what causes all the issues with guest complaints as well as the bottleneck of traffic. This was and is still a problem at Auto, so just know if you do come into the line, make sure you have the correct time as well as the correct attraction because it does cause a backup if you don't. You can probably guess the problems that this causes, and I sort of talked about it in my surface level operations video. Now I'll cover a few instances where I dealt with, um, fun guests. The amount of entitlement people have with Lightning Lane is astounding. I understand that you feel like you deserve to cut the line because you spent the extra 20 bucks on Lightning Lane, but you know, so did all the other people in the line as well. It's not my fault that you booked it at a dumb time when it had a 5 minute wait. Yeah, I had some old lady yell at me because she spent all this money and we had no line. I told her you were supposed to book on attractions that, you know, had a longer wait time, or use it on ours when we had a longer wait, like later in the day. She wasn't the only one, of course, but you get the idea. Another instance is when we're running three tracks, and when Lightning Lane eventually merges with Standby, they assume the third track is Lightning Lane, and get mad at us when we send them down with the normies on that side, and then they have to wait longer because they chose the side that was running less vehicles. The last and most common instance is when people would come all the way down to our Lightning Lane entrance, and not have the correct time, or have the wrong attraction, and just stand there and block the line so others can't go into the standby side. It got to the point where we didn't want to argue with these clowns, and that we would just say, sure, come on in, it's not like Auto is a super popular attraction. If you want to fight about riding the baby car ride, then go ahead and do it. I'm not going to get verbally or physically assaulted because you don't know how to read. Just know that I hated working lightly at this attraction because it had more stupid attached to it than Star Tours. Stories from the lift position. I'm sort of going position to a position for this video as most revolve around smaller stories at certain positions, and the next one is no exception. Our lift position was a job in charge of operating the lifts for guests as well as assisting them with the line and other miscellaneous things like lost and found and updating wait times. You get the idea. The most important part of this job is helping out the parties that need the elevator as well as parties that have wheelchairs, strollers, or electric scooters. Well, I have a few stories from this position that I obviously want to tell. The first story has nothing to do with the lift, but a random day in the winter holiday season of 2019. The park was at full capacity, and Autopia was running all four tracks, eight cars every dispatch. Our line was also at max capacity, but we were getting people on as fast as we could. Anyway, I was at the lift position, and everything seemed to be going fine, until I hear some guy screaming in the line. I thought he like hurt himself or something, but it turns out two drunk dudes got in a fight because they were too close to each other in their own personal bubble or whatever. I ended up radioing my lead that two dummies were fighting each other in the line, and security ended up showing up very quickly surprisingly. Oh yeah, 
During the middle of this, some lady came up to me and handed me a bag of vomit. She said that she wasn't feeling well, and there was more in the room with all the TVs. Oh yeah, also to add on, someone cracked their head open because they were swinging on the bars and came up to me with their head bleeding right after security left. One of my coworkers ended up escorting them to first aid, but it's just like, really? All of this at once? Yeah, it does happen sometimes. Speaking all at once. This is a genuine question, but do people that use wheelchairs communicate with others that have one? Like, whenever I was at the lift position, I would get back-to-back -back parties that had someone using a wheelchair. I mean, it's not like it's a big deal, but it's just a genuine question. It's sort of related to the next story because I got a rush of wheelchairs one time, and due to safety reasons, we can only have two parties with the wheelchair be down on the platform that has a lift. Sometimes people can use stairs so we can send them down the side without a lift, but this one lady got super pissed at me because we already had the maximum amount of people down on the platform. From their perspective, I get it, but it's because in case of an emergency, we need to know where our guests are, especially those that have wheelchairs. Trust me, I've seen it happen firsthand where the Disneyland Fire Department had to carry out this poor guy off the attraction because we had to do a full evacuation and he couldn't walk. Anyway, this lady said that she needed to get on right now or else. Well, after about five minutes of pestering me, the other lift party finally came back and I could send her down. Well, I sent her down and her party down the lift side and she didn't even end up riding. Like, she made me pull up the, a car and get our special handicap slider out just for her to say, never mind, it's not worth it anymore. I mean, I get that she was frustrated, but to make us stop our operation to get everything set up, for all for her to say, nah, I don't wanna. Like, if she didn't want to slide into her car, I would get it, but she was just screaming, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, like a child over and over again. Why make a scene like this, lady? I ended up sending her back up the lift, and she ended up waiting for her family to come back. Her family finally returned, and then she threw me under the bus to her family, and said I didn't help her at all, and how I was a terrible human being. Her family then apologized for her behavior, and left after that. Yeah, I don't really get it, man. Now for another fun lift story of this guy who was an electric scooter. Now, I want to make it clear that this guy was a bit on the heavier side, and we had to transfer him into a wheelchair, since our lift can't handle the weight of the Disneyland rental scooters. Well, this guy wasn't really participating with us as he was shoveling popcorn into his mouth, and he would only stop to take a swig of one of his three 2 liter Diet Cokes. It's like, bro, we want to help you out, but he wasn't talking to us, and his family was ignoring us too. We ended up piecing together that they needed the lift, and I kid you not, he took out a 20 ounce Diet Coke out of his pocket to take with him on the transfer wheelchair. Also, yes, he was still shoveling popcorn into his mouth as he transferred, by the way. I unfortunately was bumped out for my break, so I didn't get to see this guy come back up, but I can only imagine he ran out of popcorn, since he only took one of his three buckets. I really hope that guy drinks some water after that, because that's a one-way ticket to getting dehydrated real quick. I have a ton of dehydration stories, but I'll save that for my monorail one, since it happened a lot there, surprisingly. Now, the last story for this position goes out to all those that think they can skip the line by having one wheelchair in their party. We always had that one party once or twice a week that had a party in the double digits, but only had one wheelchair. The most we could send down on the platform was six cars worth, so people with more than that would unfortunately have to be split up. Usually the wheelchair plus one to go down the lift, and the rest of the party had to wait in the line, as by the time they would get down to the lift, the rest of their party would be heading down the stairs to get a number. Yeah, I would get crap from guests for doing this, but remember, a lot of people on a platform isn't really safe, especially when emergencies happen. Now let's move on to the hardest position at the resort. Grouping Idiots Believe it or not, grouping isn't really that hard depending on the attraction. You just put people onto a number and or row. Couldn't be too hard, right? Haha, <laughs> I would agree with you, but Autopia has one of the hardest grouping systems, you know, at the resort. If you can group at Auto, you can group anywhere. Now, working the attractions for almost 5 years helps out in my case, but I can tell you, this position became three times harder since returning from the pandemic. I'm not going to go into detail about grouping as I did with the whole stupid long section on my surface level operations video, and uh, I would highly recommend watching that, at least that chapter, before continuing listening to this part of the video, because I'm not going to be going into those types of details. Uh, anyway, just know when we tell you to stand on a number, there's a color attached to it as well. For example, a party of two cars would go to green 4 and 5, or a party of three cars go on red 2, 3, and 4. You get the idea? Okay. Okay, 
Can you tell me why I tell your party to go to red 4 and 5, and yet somehow y'all are on blue 3 and 4? I know I just said orange 3, and yet somehow they teleport to the other platform, but luckily they're on the correct number, just on the wrong color and platform. I know Rise of the Resistance has this uh, color thing going on as well, but they don't have the number attached to it. But I've seen the first hand struggles with people and the colors. If you're colorblind, I get it 100%, but um, eh, yeah. I know it's not just an Autopia thing either because I had my first hand with this at Star Tours and guess not understanding where they had to stand in the row on the dots. Majority of guests were fine with this and didn't have an issue, but that's just a small idiotic minority that would just, you know, make life difficult for us. Now, I understand that red might sound like right, and l sometimes, you know, we don't speak clearly, but this position was the most babysitter position there is. What I would do, and we were supposed to do, is group aside, walk up and down the platform to make sure everyone's standing on their number. You would also have people not stand on their number, and just in the entryway where cars are driving by. The problem with it is there is way too much freedom at this attraction, and guests can't follow simple directions of y'all are going to stand on blue 4 through 6. Another can of worms is doing the wraparound where a party would get split up, with two being on 5 and 6 and the last one being on number 1. It seems like people just don't understand that it's just one big circle, and one is going to be behind 6 every single time a new set of cars comes in. Now let's go ahead and talk about the fun part of dealing with dummies that wanted a certain car color. I had well, this one family that begged me for a blue car and I tried my best to accommodate but sometimes certain colors might not be on a certain track or just might be extremely difficult to accommodate just of how you know the cars are coming in. I can also tell you firsthand that all the cars are the same regardless of body and or color. They all got the same engine inside, the only difference is the steering wheel might be on a different side depending on which track you're on. I had this one guy throw a big man baby fit because he didn't want his kid driving a no British car and threatened to pick up the car and throw it at me. You know, as much as I wanted to see this guy lift up a car, I just said, fine, here's an American car, but then threw a fit because, you know, the car was brown and not the shiny blue one he was in earlier. No winning sometimes with these people, man. Also, no, he couldn't pick up one of those cars as they weigh up to 600 pounds or more. I'm not 100% sure on how much they weigh, but I know they're stupid heavy. Speaking of 600 pounds, remember how I told you as lift you help people down and up the lift? Well, there's this one guy that was probably 600 pounds that came down the lift as he was wide as the little cars themselves. I'm not trying to fat shame people, but that must have been really uncomfortable to ride in those cars as they're very low to the ground and it took him like 5 minutes to get in and sadly it took him 15 minutes to get out. His poor kid was with him too and the little girl was all squished to all hell in between him and the car. Now I can tell you that I'm not the skinniest either, but those cars are not comfortable for me, you know, a uh, 5'8 dude that's, you know, probably 200 plus pounds. I can only imagine it was not comfortable for this guy and his poor child. Don't worry, I have more stories of guests doing guest things. I did what we call doubling up, and I had two complete strangers go on the same number. The idea is, one's supposed to get in while the other is supposed to get in on the next set of cars. Well, I guess these two complete strangers got in the same car because they hit it off. Some people will also randomly leave without telling us, or decide last minute that they want to go together. I mean. It's fine, we can fix it, but it's just annoying. This one couple decided last minute that they wanted to go together. They were on blue 5 and 6, and both of them got into number 6. They then got mad at my coworker on track that the car in front of them wasn't going, and that's where, you know, I had to step in to find out they wanted to go together last minute. <sighs> I then had to explain that the car in front of them was the empty one that one of them was supposed to get into, and the guy told me to shut up, nerd. As much as I wanted to leave the car empty and let them sit in the sun for a bit, I quickly filled the car to keep our line moving, despite my desire to give some hospitality back if you know what I mean. Now I mentioned that grouping became a nightmare after the pandemic, and that's just because more guests don't really follow directions like they used to. I worked Autopia for almost a year before the world shut down, and rarely had an issue with someone not going to their number, unless it was a language barrier. After we reopened, it seemed like I had to correct my platform every other time I finished one side. It was starting to get so bad that I had to walk people to their numbers and wait for them to get into their cars because so many guests would just change their mind last minute or just dip out 
or somehow go to the other platform, or just something else that's stupid. Also, more people asking for accommodations like racing each other, or certain colors. Not that I don't mind doing that when I could, but when you act like a screaming toddler and you're 40, you know, I'm less likely to want to help you out. Let's go ahead and wrap up this chapter with stating that, as weird as it sounds, this was one of my favorite positions at the attraction. I sort of liked the chaos, but I mainly liked it because it was one of the small things I was in control over, like the weird control freak I am. <laughs> there were some times where it was overwhelming due to a lot of moving parts, and you know, it all happening all at once. Especially when you have a terrible coworkers, you know, that aren't really helping you out when it comes to little things, but I'll cover that in a different video. Now let's move on to the track position stories. Dummies on track. Track positions are the bulk of this attraction. They wave in cars, make sure people are buckled up, and make sure cars go and stop when they're supposed to. Now, it works pretty well on paper, but, you know, guests don't use paper, they just, um, I don't know. I couldn't think of a dumb metaphor. Regardless, guests get in and get out the same way. Sometimes they hop into our side or try to walk around the car to get into the driver's seat or lift up the back to put their bags into even though that's where the engines are. It's always a good time on track. This position is also in charge of making sure guests are standing in the box on the platform and I can tell you that usually I can tell when a party is sharing the same brain cell as everyone in that party is outside the box and trying to step onto the track where the moving cars are. There was this one time where I was on the fourth track and this little kid, probably like three or four, looked at me and literally did a suicidal fall onto the track and almost got hit by a car. This was the only time I've ever grabbed a kid at my job. I literally jumped in front of the car, grabbed this kid and put him back on the platform. The kid was like, whoa, that was crazy. And I told him, you can't do that, buddy. It's dangerous. Oh, yeah. The parent was on their phone, not paying attention. I took my kid on recently for the first time, as she's finally tall enough to get on, and previously working the attraction, I was like, yeah, you're staying with me, bub. You know, kids on track were a common thing at this attraction. Kids always like to run onto the track to try to show off to their friend. This also goes with teenagers on a date, and I can't tell you how many times I've dealt with hooligan teenagers on track. They are barely in their car for five seconds, and are already bumping into their buddy up front. This doesn't excuse the teenage girls either, mainly because they would all try to cram into a car together, and it's like three in a car at most. I had this one teenage boy try to side pedal a car, and I'm like, absolutely not. I'm like, sit down, bro. Only for him to, you know, call me a very nice word and spit on me. Grad nights were not fun to work anywhere in the park, by the way. Speaking of dummies, I have this one story that's a real doozy. There's this one guy, probably in his 40s, that told me his car wasn't going. I told him that he had to push down the pedal, and then he told me that it was for decoration, and that I went up into the tower building and turned off the power to his car specifically, just to mess with him. Yeah. <laughs> I told him, the cars aren't electric powered, and that he's supposed to push down the pedal for it to go, and you can tell where this is going. After about five minutes of going back and forth with this idiot, this random lady comes up and screams at him, You push the pedal down, you moron! She then hopped in the car with this guy, slammed down on the pedal, for me to only hear, Oh, it is a real pedal, as they drove off into the distance. I don't know who this lady is, but <laughs> she was the true MVP here. I don't get why people make these wild conspiracy theories about us, man. Oh yeah, speaking of conspiracy theories, I had this one lady that refused to put on her seatbelt. Why, you may ask? She told me, with a straight face by the way, that seatbelts are like vaccines and they don't work. I was kind of taken back of how retarded someone can be, but that's just putting it nicely. I told her she could either buckle up or leave. Believe it or not, she just left because she said seatbelts went against her beliefs. Well, I can only tell you that she probably couldn't get on some of the other attractions later in the day because of her beliefs. I understand that you might not fly out of the car as an adult, and it seems stupid, but you know, we're paid to make sure that you're safe. That means wearing a seatbelt that goes against, you know, your beliefs. I got in a lot of tussles with guests wearing their seatbelts at auto, and it was getting to the point where I was just like buckling the seatbelt up for them because, yeah. Some people do not know how to buckle up a seatbelt. Yeah, it's not like it's a simple buckle onto the other end of the seat, but it's not hard to figure out. I had this one guy full on tied around his waist like a freaking sweater, and I'm just like, you know what, whatever. Go ahead. I swear some guests would treat seatbelts like that complicated puzzle from Uncharted. 
Like, you don't have to solve a 12 hour puzzle just to put one end onto the other. Then there was them looking for the pedal. Some guests would look for the pedal like it was that one weekend Super Bowl meme. You know it's what I'm talking about. They were looking all around, and this one guy literally pushed down the side pedal on the side of the car with his hand to make the car go because he couldn't find the pedal. He came back and whined at me and said that his hand hurt. I'm like, yeah, you freaking idiot sandwich. The pedal was in the car. I seriously wonder how some of these adults never touched a vehicle before. I mean, I know not everyone drives a car, but cars are pretty simple, especially when it's just pedal and steering wheel. Don't worry, I have more instances of idiocy on the track. I remember this one guy and his kid went around the car and then pissed in the bushes next to the track. Yeah, you heard that right. Both him and his kid pissed in the bushes. They walked around the car, took a piss, and then got on the car on the wrong side. I was just at a loss for words with piss man and his little sidekick little piss boy. Not as bad as the turkey lady. Oh yeah, it gets better. This one older lady was getting out of her car on the wrong side, and I was like, oh no ma'am, you can't go out that way. She then told me to mind my own damn business and got out onto the track, now standing next to me. I told her that she had to go back through the car to get off onto the platform. She then gobbled like a turkey and screamed that I pushed her down, which I didn't. She then walked down the track toward the attraction's ride path itself, wiggling her arms up in the air like one of those inflatable tube mans and gobbling like a turkey. What the fudge, man? Luckily, one of the maintenance cast members was nearby and literally grabbed this turkey lady and walked her back to the platform. He called her an idiot in front of the entire station and she said she was going to go to City Hall to complain about us. It's like, lady, you almost got your shins hit by an uncommon car and you also made us hold our entire attraction because you wanted to be the comedic form of one of those necromorphs from Dead Space out on the attraction. I'm still at a loss from what I saw even to this day. Like, I'd rather just admit that I messed up, but this lady had to act like some weird alien tried to call back her mothership or something. I don't know, man. Let's go ahead and finish off this chapter with one more guest that really pissed me off. Besides the guests yelling at me and cussing me out because I told them where to stand, this guy really made my blood boil of how stupidly arrogant he was being. This guy and his family wanted to go again, and I told them, you know what, that's fine, you guys can just get out so we can get these next people on board and then we'll regroup you. This guy then went off the deep end and started calling me a racist and how I was discriminating against him because of his skin color. And I was like, dude, I was just asking you to take turns. After a few minutes of back and forth, he finally got out of his car and the next set of cars came in. He then got into his new car and complained that it was too small. I'm like, are you serious? And then one of his family members ended up switching cars with him but it was the same exact car model, but just a different color. And then he was like, ah, much better, and then drove off with his family. Not only did this guy cause a delay on our track because he didn't want to take turns, but he accused me of being a racist and yelled at my other coworker who's trying to be nice as well. I can tell you firsthand that I would never call someone out for their skin color, but I will call you out if you're acting like a douche, regardless of your race, gender, or age. I have more track stories, but they're all sort of the same issue, different guests and different day. I'm going to go to another position, and that's the one that waves cars in. I also have some stories that happened out on the attraction, but I will cover those in a bit. Just know that we had to change our sayings on track to no bumping to no bumping and stay in your cars at all times. I wonder why we had to say that. Anyway, let's talk about our traffic stop position. Traffic stop. This is another one of our many positions that waves in the flow of traffic. This position sits in cars once the station clears out, six to eight at a time depending on how many slots we have open at the station. Well, this position is also a safety critical position and we cannot leave our little island unless stayed by a lead and or manager. Now please don't take that as a harass the cast member at this position, but as a please understand that we can't do much when your car stalls out. We can send for someone on track to help you out or we can tell you how to try and restart your car. Now let me tell you a little story about the time I almost stepped off platform. There was this random day where I was sitting in cars and I saw out of the corner of my eye a family with a boy who was autistic. The boy seemed like he was getting overwhelmed by all the noises in the station and he ended up running out onto the track towards where I was sending cars in. Without thinking, I almost jumped off the platform to stop this kid from running into moving cars, but luckily the cars I was sending in stopped and one of my coworkers stepped in too once they saw that this kid was about to book it. Luckily nobody got hurt and I didn't get a written safety on my record for protecting a guest. I know it sounds asinine but this is how it is sometimes at our job. 
Now this next story comes from a foreign family. I was at the position and this little kid in a green car was staring at me. I'm guessing he was eagerly waiting to go, but I was wrong, dead wrong. This little boy stood up and I was like, oh no, you gotta sit down buddy, and then he did the unthinkable. I kid you not, this kid pulled down his pants, butt and all, and pissed on the hood of the car. I was kind of shocked and tried to get his mom's attention, but she was on her phone and kind of swished her arm at me in the air when I tried to get her attention. The kid then pulled back up his pants, sat down, and drove off. Like, was that a flex? Did he just have to go? What's with these people and pissing on the attraction? Like, what the hell, man? My coworker on the other platform saw this happen too, and he was just laughing. It was just <laughs> like I was at a loss with this one, especially since it was my first week on the job. He just said, welcome to Disneyland, buddy, and it continued to laugh. Speaking of this coworker, we had another instance together with another guest on a different day. A man was holding down his pedal and pushing into the car in front of him, not giving a care in the world. This dude's car was starting to smoke and I was telling him to stop on the PA as much as I could. The smoke on his car went from light gray to almost black. The engine in his car literally caught fire and my coworker I mentioned earlier grabbed one of our nearby fire extinguishers and had to put out the fire on the poor little green car. The guest was like, dude, my car is broken. Yeah, you freaking dipstick, you almost blew it up. We had to pull that car off and that guest got a nice conversation with a manager and security. Just to spoil something for you, if you destroy Disney's property, let's just say you'll probably get billed for it and I can tell you those engines are not cheap. Believe it or not, this is a common occurrence at this position. As guests, usually teenage boys or men, thinking they are the coolest by rubbernecking and causing the cars to burn out like this. I can tell you, it releases a terrible odor that I hate the smell of. It's like the smell of burning water, but not the pleasant boiling kind for like noodles or something. You would know it if you smelt it. This is one of my biggest pet peeves at this position, is cool kids thinking it's funny to break the cars and cause delay for others. Yeah, I get it sucks waiting to get off, but destroying your vehicle makes it take longer for you to get off, and usually you get to have a nice conversation with the adults of the park. Another thing guests would do, besides, you know, piss on cars, is get out at the stop. Like, oh, the ride's done, we can get out. It's like, no, you can't. You saw how the car came in. You gotta return it where you got it from. There was a big problem for a few months where guests would just get out before getting back into the station because it was taking too long. This was especially true when we were assisting guests using a wheelchair to get into their car, as it would cause a delay on that certain track. I don't understand how they could be patient in our 60 minute line, but can't wait 3 minutes to get off. This was extremely common when it was raining, but like, you knew it was raining before getting on the attraction, and now you're upset that you're getting wet? Yeah, breaking cars, pissing on them, or just getting out was a common thing here. Maybe not pissing on them, but I would always see this happen at this position, or overlooking when I was up at the monorail station and the Tomorrowland side. Now let's go ahead and finish off with the last position and some other stories and the attraction. We have two positions that are out on the attraction's ride path itself. One is located next to the Matterhorn area and one that wanders the attraction itself. Sometimes we have an extra person or two that wanders during busier times or grad nights, but it all depends on staffing availability. Anyway, wandering the attraction usually meant helping out little kids that couldn't push down the pedal on their own. You remember how I said the secondary height requirement meant you could barely push down the pedal? Well, some kids struggled with this, and that's what this position does. We help out kids, or adults, that can't push down the pedal for the little 5 minute cruise. We would also restart any stalled cars, as well as, you know, just babysit the attraction. Remember how I said people would hop out of their cars just because? Well, this was a super big issue post-pandemic. The cars were stalling out more frequently, and guests would hop out of their cars because it's broken. I can tell you, 90% of the time it was just pumping your pedal a few times will fix it. This is what we would normally do when restarting their vehicles by the way. Only a handful of times would we actually have to restart their car or even get it towed back to the station. Anyway, I believed it was the summer of 2022 where cars were breaking down like crazy and guests were getting very bold and they would hop out of their cars. I was usually at monorail during this time but I could see a guest wandering the attraction because their car broke down or they are just hopping out, or for the TikTok. And yes, I do have a social media story that will be its own chapter in a bit. On a handful of times, I caught someone trying to hop out of their car, and I would have to tell them to hop back in. It was always the same thing. Would you do this on a freeway? 
Well, no, of course not. Some guests think, oh, it's Disneyland and I can't get hurt here. There were even some crazy lunatics that thought we controlled the weather too and made it hot to sell more water. <laughs> yeah, that was that's actually true. I'm not gonna... That's a completely different topic that I'm not even gonna touch. But you get what I mean. And uh, just to improv off my script a little bit, one of the funniest things I ever saw was I was at the monorail and I was at the gritter position and I watched a guest walk into our little cast member area with a water bottle. They filled up their water bottle in the little cast member area and then they walked back onto the attraction <laughs> to go get back in their car. Like, how did they know the water bottle station was there to, you know, fill up their water? Where did they even come from? How come nobody saw it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna... The most common one I would come across is an abandoned car. It was usually a kid that couldn't drive anymore and their parent hopped in. But this one time, my coworker and I caught a great one. There was this car that was abandoned and a line of cars behind it. The guest that was in the car was full on screaming at us that the car in front of them wasn't going anymore and we were like what happened to the people in front of it after a few minutes of going back and forth as well as us making radio calls to hold the other cars at the station for moving the guy said that his kid was in front of him and hopped into the his car like why couldn't you just tell us that to start off with my coworker was in like well dummy the car can't go anywhere unless there's someone in it and screaming at us isn't going to help solve the problem he told them next time you don't have your kid hop out of the car because it's dangerous and the dad told us to F off. My coworker pretty much played the petty card, and my lead eventually made their way out. My lead then talked to this idiot parent, and I ended up driving the car back that was in front of them. It was just like, all he had to say was, yeah, that was our car, but instead he yelled at us and called us idiots. Also, it would have been more efficient for him to get into his kid's car, which is what most people do. No, he had to abandon the car that was in front of him and get mad at us because the personless car wasn't going anywhere. Remember that position near the Matterhorn? Well, that was a common area for people to think it was funny to bump each other. I had these two grad night kids bumping into each other and I stopped them. The leader was like, what the heck, bro? He was bumping into me. I then said a very out of pocket thing, but you know, grad night kids need a reality check. I told him that he could go bump his bro behind closed doors, but he can't do it on my attraction. This grad night kid then said he wasn't gay and drove off while his bro was just dead silent and slowly followed him. It's one of the few rules that we have and act like an idiot, get treated like one. Yeah, Grand Night kids are the worst. I also had these other Grand Night boys get out of their car and try to climb onto the low part of the monorail beam. Lucky for them, I was close by and I was able to stop them from getting onto the beam itself. But it's like, how stupid could you be? Not only was he going to climb up on the side with the, the bus bar, but his buddy was trying to film him. The only thing that he would have filmed was his idiot friend getting 600 volts of electricity to his body. I can only imagine if I didn't catch them when I did. You get the idea. Dummies hopping out of their cars and doing stupid stuff. Luckily, most of the time, it was just us helping out little kids. Sometimes they would tell us no that they don't need help, and it was awful, especially when adults were driving slowly. It was usually a grandma of the group, and they refused for us to help them out. This one old lady took 25 minutes to go all the way around. I know because I was trying to help her out and literally walk the entire attraction with her, as she you knows she's driving her car at freaking Lincoln town car speed. I don't know. I was trying to help her out, but she kept yelling at me in Spanish, and I could tell you that it wasn't a friendly help me out from the Spanish that I do know. Anyway, the next story is involving this position actually, but it's special enough to get its own chapter. For the Graham. Now, for those of you that peruse the Disneyland subreddit may have caught me telling this story. I was wandering the attraction and noticed an empty car in the campground area of the attraction. I was like, ah oh, great, another person wandered backstage. Well, upon further investigation, I noticed a couple was taking pictures on the actual campground set. I then had to radio, you know, my coworkers to tell them to hold all the traffic and try to usher these dipsticks back into their car. I told them that they had to get back in their car. The lady said, no, I'm taking pictures for Instagram. And that's when I was like, oh no. I told them they needed to get back into the car or else security was going to get involved. She then told me something that's so pretentious. She then asked me if I knew who she was, and obviously I didn't. I just knew that she was some idiot that was now trespassing. She told me that she had 10,000 followers on the platform and I should treat her with respect. <laughs> respect? <laughs> no. 
I have 7,000 followers on YouTube, but you don't see me busting down the door at Red Lobster and taking pictures of the kitchen with the chefs. Like, just because you can see it doesn't mean you can be here. I then told her to delete her photos and I won't get security involved. Her camera boyfriend was then trying to get on my side and was being all nervous saying that they should go. She then threw a big hissy fit and you know it didn't help that other cars were starting to drive by as the attraction still had a few stragglers left. I then told the standby people to not record this as our management team doesn't like it when these sorts of things happen. It makes them look bad. Luckily they drove off and respected my request unlike this Instagram bimbo over here. Now I'm getting questioned on the radio of how the situation is going and my leader is getting involved too since they finally returned from their roll call. The camera boyfriend was starting to get really nervous and he didn't want to get kicked out of the park. The lady then told him to stop being such a little bench and told him to take a few more pictures. She said just to ignore me because I was blocking her light. Yeah. I was then about to throw out my nice final threat. I told her to delete the photos, get back in her car, or else security was going to drag her off the attraction. Then her and her camera boyfriend were probably just going to get a ban for trespassing and taking pictures in a restricted area. It's just like, you can take pictures of the attraction, but not like this. Now about 10 minutes have gone by and traffic has been held. I made the call to my lead to get security involved. Surprisingly, her camera boyfriend took her phone showed me deleting the photos and Foley by the way, and then grabbed her by the arm and said we need to go. I don't want her passes to get revoked. They then hopped back in the car and drove off. I then made the call to my lead and told them that they were on their way back and that they could resume traffic once more. I then headed back to the station and saw them getting talked to by one of my managers. Luckily for them, they got let off with a warning and were told not to return to our attraction for the rest of the day. I still had to write a statement for the whole incident though. Shaking my head, dude. Now, this is unrelated to the story, but I wanted to shine some light on this. I had someone on the subreddit try to tell me I was going against their First Amendment right. While yes, technically, they had every right to take pictures on the attraction, but it was considered private property once they left their vehicles and put themselves into danger. Now, for legal reasons, I didn't demand them to delete the photos, but I asked them to. I did not say, hey, you can't leave unless you delete your photos. I simply asked them as it would cause a monkey see, monkey do effect. While I'm not a lawyer, I do know that taking pictures of private property can cause legal issues later down the line, and them doing this probably wouldn't have held up that great in court, especially against Disney lawyers. From a former cast member, do not get out of your vehicles to take pictures, let alone for any reason unless a cast member tell you it's okay. Alright, cool, cool, I'm glad we agree. The Killer Pinecone yeah, there was a killer pinecone on the loose, and it was taking out all the drivers that crossed its path. <laughs> nah, I kid. Believe it or not, Autopia has a lot of trees on the right path, and those trees, you know, have tree stuff. Sometimes pine needles or bugs hanging out, or pine cones would fall off the branches. You know, usual tree stuff or something. Well, this story is a short one, but one I wanted to tell. I was coming back into work one day, and the attraction was silent. When you hear Autopia is silent, that means the cars are all off and the attraction is closed. It's honestly a surreal feeling not hearing those little lawnmower engines and Tomorrowland goes extremely quiet without them. Anyway, this lady got hit in the head by a rogue pinecone. Now, yeah, I'm on her side that it sucks to get smacked by nature, but it's where what happened next is why I'm telling this story. She got nicked by this tiny little pinecone and the only reason I know is because she was holding it and screaming about it. I just come in and this lady is screaming about how she's going to sue the trees on the attraction and then she's going to sue Disney and then she's going to sue the people that cut the trees. Yeah, she was screaming about how the tree cutters should have done a better job plucking all the pine cones off the trees and how it's the trees first and then something about how Disney is trying to keep her quiet and not to go to social media about this. A handful of us had to walk the attraction because she ended up getting one of our higher up managers involved because she was a shareholder and how dare we treat her like this. Honestly, I did feel for her, but after she went off the deep end, we were just like, can we reopen or not? We were closed for a good two to three hours after this because we had to make sure there were no more pine cones that were going to fall and make sure the ride path was clear of debris. We literally walked the ride path and swept everything off to the side, pine needles and all. I mean, hey, easy money, I guess. It was just crazy that this lady made such a big deal about a tiny little pine cone. 
She must have had some sort of power because one of my manager's managers is out, and usually they never come out to this attraction. Well, that wraps up my Autopia guest stories video thing. I have more stories to tell, but they're on the um, not safe for work side, and I'll save that for a different video. I also have other miscellaneous stories, but um, eh, these were the ones that I thought were important enough for a video. The next video will be on Monorail. I was also a lead at Monorail, so I'll be including my guest stories as both a lead and a normal cast member for that video. I know I said I was going to do auto for last, but I figured Monorail would be a little bit longer if I combined both my regular and lead stories into one video. Plus, that's where I was 90% of the time when I was working there, so it's probably going to be the longest anyway. Anyway, these videos will be coming out roughly every month or so to not oversaturate my channel with uh, Disney content. Anyway, thanks for watching this video, or listening. If you like the video and want to help support my channel, go ahead and check out some of my other content. I make various amounts of skits, films, and other series. I even have a series where I talk about the attractions I worked at on a surface level. I know I mentioned it in the video before, but probably a good time to catch up on the monorail one since that will be the next video. Other than that, uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye